Hello and welcome to another episode of Not Too Deep. I'm your host, Grace Helbig. I am thoroughly thrilled to have Meg and Jane Crabb on today's episode. You might know her as Body Posse Panda. She's went through a little bit of a rebrand, a.k.a. she's just using her actual uh, adult woman name on the, the Instagrams and the social media platforms. We talk through why that change happened, um, what it feels like to build a community uh, around body positivity in a world online when the opposite of like fitspiration and all of that can fucking, you know, ruin your actual view of yourself. We also talk about what it's like to grow and change online and how you speak to that uh, with your audience and how they can grow and change with you. We also talk about her amazing sister, Gemma. We get to that and many other things. She's just so, so lovely and has some really thoughtful uh, and sound advice about all different life questions that we all have. So please enjoy this episode of Not Too Deep with Megan Jane Crabb. <laughs> Megan, uh, hi and welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. You have the most white teeth. They're beautiful. <laughs> I think I have I have a, di- a light directly here because you <laughs> caught me in this like miserable English weather. So that's it's an illusion. <laughs> well, it looks fantastic. <laughs> I have so many things that I want to talk to you about. Um, but first of all, obviously, I want to find out like, how do you describe what it is that you do? I ask this of lots of people that have kind of, um, you know, uh, new media ish uh, jobs. And I'm curious how you describe what you do. <laughs> new media ish. Um, <laughs> I It has changed a lot over time. It has mm-hmm. changed a lot. Uh, back in the day, I probably would have just said influencer because there weren't really many other options. And I create things on the internet. These right. days, I'm probably more likely to go with a quite um pretentious multi-hyphenated creator writer presenter but creator I think creator is nice it's a it's a well-rounded word I agree because I feel like you don't just do one thing I think you have this very thoughtful artist quality to everything you do which I find really fascinating um but with that how did you how did you end up here how did you end up making stuff online so I just used to use social media in your regular ways. I posted pictures of my lunch and like fruit bowls yep. as, as people do. Obviously. And I also used it for diet inspiration. So I would just follow mm. all of these Fitspo people, all of these supermodels. I would just compare myself all day long. Mm-hmm. And then one day I accidentally stumbled across the complete opposite, which was a very small group of body positive people on Instagram talking about accepting themselves as they were and not dieting for their entire life. And hey, maybe you don't have to hate yourself. And a radical was concept. A revelation. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you, in the year, when was this? In the year 2015, mm-hmm. fairly radical. Um, and I, they just got in my head and I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Uh, and so I decided to dive in because I tried everything up until that point to try and accept myself. You know, I had tried... Yeah diets for so many years. I'd had eating disorders when I was a teenager Mm -hmm. and nothing had brought me that like mythical happiness that diet culture tells us that we'll get once we're perfect. So I thought I'm going to try this instead. Um, And I just started using social media to document what I was learning. It became Mm. just kind of a diary. Yeah. And it just gathered steam as the movement grew, as the platform grew. And here we are, like seven-ish years later. Wow. Was there a turning point for you when you realized like, oh, this is a bit bigger than myself and I should treat this as a community growing situation versus I'm just putting up pictures of things randomly? Like, mm. did you did you kind of focus or dial in on creating your your brand or business out of it? <laughs> um, to be honest, I'm still not sure I'm doing that very well. Um, I I feel the same <laughs> way. I have so many questions about because I feel like I look through, uh, you know, all of your social media and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Everything she is saying, everything she is uh, representing is so much of what I think about and what I struggle with. And I appreciate how candid you are with like y- y- what you're doing. I think it's so cool. Oh, thank you, Angel. Um, but to answer your your previous question, yeah, I think there was definitely a point where 
it's it clicked that it was less for me and more for others mm-hmm. in that I had been on the journey. I was in a place where I felt like quite confident in my in how I felt about myself. So it became more how can I bring as many people as possible into this with me? Because if I'd spent my entire life not being aware that accepting myself was even an option, then there must have been hundreds, thousands, however many people in the same boat. And especially like people who I believed had been through the similar things to me. So young women who'd had eating disorders and never, never even liked themselves. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to reach to them. And yeah, there definitely was, there definitely was that point. There and so we go from there and you write books after this, like shortly after. What was that process like of diving from doing internet stuff to putting it in like a published form? Oh Lord. Let me tell you, if you ever want to reduce yourself to like a crumbling mess of anxiety, write a book. Write a book. It's great fun. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I feel um, that. <laughs> it was, you know, books had been so instrumental to me in my unlearning Mm -hmm. that I kind of wanted to gather up everything that had, that I had learnt, combine it with this new kind of movement that was taking place online and tell my story. And that's what I did. So I just put it all in one place. Um, And to this day I say, that's, well, that's everything I know. That's everything (laughs) I know on this topic. I I don't think I have any more to give at this point. It's in that book. Um, And I'm proud of it, but I wasn't proud of it at the time. It was like a really, Mm. um, it really does test you. It really does test you going from, I make things on the internet to I'm an author. Who do I think I am? You know, it's, it's, isn't it bizarre that there is this like inherent shame of making just digital content or making just, you're just a girl in your room, putting things on the internet. Uh, what right do you have to exist in some other space where there are professionals? And mm. I I feel that anxiety and that imposter syndrome all the time. But then I realize everyone is feeling that too. Or I have to remind myself <laughs> that everyone is feeling that. But also putting stuff in a book is such an intimate and like concrete thing. It's not like you post a video and then you can bury it with another video. Like this is a <laughs> tangible item. It must have been very... Uh, I'm curious about the process of putting personal stuff in the book versus like what you kept out. I don't think I kept anything out. Uh-huh. I remember I started writing the book in, it must have been like 2016 that I actually started. Mm. And at the time <laughs> I wasn't in therapy. Um, mm. I hadn't I hadn't processed a lot of my stuff around my eating disorder and what I had been through. And I started trying to write about it. And it really did feel like taking a whole new lens on this most traumatic part of my life to make sense of it for me and for everyone else. I was kind of writing this chapter on eating disorders to figure out why I had been through what I had been through. Yeah. Um, I started therapy. Best idea I've ever had. Oh, I'm with you. <laughs> I, can't, I can't promote it enough if people are able to uh, seek it out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolute lifesaver. And, um, it really did feel like my soul, like it, it felt like putting my soul out there. Um, Mm. and it was such a personal reaction to, you know, what everyone around me thought about it. So I was like, this is me, read this and you will understand everything that I've ever been through. So it's intense. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm sure the feedback that you got was even more intense than the process too, of people pouring their souls back out to you. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm also curious because recently you've done, I guess, like a, a rebrand. Is that the best way to kind of uh, qualify what's happening on your Instagram? Yeah. 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 I've done a, I've done a name change. Okay. But it's just gone to my name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, I was body posy panda for lots and lots of years. And like I was saying before, Instagram to me was a diary of unlearning all this body shame that I had. Mm. And that was a fitting name. And I love pandas and it's it's cute and it's catchy. And I didn't necessarily want to be like entirely sharing everything about my personal life when I started. Yeah. And, you know, as it's gone on down the line and I've written the book and I've done live shows and I've spoken to so many audiences and done TV and radio and it's bigger. It's bigger than Body Posy Panda. And it was just time to 
just trying to take her off, say thank you very much for having carried me this far. It's time for me to go it as as me, as a whole multifaceted person, you know? Yeah. And I resonate so much with what you said in your video on Instagram, kind of like announcing this like gentle change and the idea that you can get lost in posting so much on social media and you can get lost in the commentary that happens. And you can, I think you said something about like, you give these hater comments so much space in your brain without even realizing it until you find yourself in this like crumbly mess of human Uh. going like, who am I? Uh, And who am I, especially if I'm not existing on the internet? I think that's such a profound thing for people to listen to other people go through and to recognize that like it is something that happens when you work online for such a consistent period of time. Was that uh, I I saw that you were like, I'm burying this uh, amongst other photos uh, to fool my algorithm. Was there like a fear in saying like we're making this change, even though it seems minor? Absolutely. It was I was very scared because there's always that chance that you take something very, very personal and very vulnerable and honest. And if you put it online, it Mm -hmm. could be met with, we don't, we don't care or (laughs) you're wrong. You know, shut up, go home. That's the nice version. (laughs) You never, you never know. It's always a gamble. And I think people who, who don't have large platforms who just use social media in a regular fun keeping up with friends way Mm -hmm. it is really hard to explain I'm sure you've experienced this like it is so hard to explain genuinely the the mental toll of having that many opinions directed at you every single day and not just about like I I don't like your t-shirt today but like this is who I think you are as a person. These are your <laughs> values. Um, you are actually this, this, and this. Uh, and it's it's it takes so much not to hollow out space inside of yourself to house those opinions. And I felt for a lot of years as Body Pussy Panda, all I, I it became so much about just trying to stay emotionally safe on online platforms yeah. and like holding all those opinions and trying to please everyone and trying to prove who I was every day. Like, look, I am, no, no, I'm this person. I am good. I am good. Um, and the name change for me and that video was really just me saying, you know what? I am whole. Mm-hmm. I am whole. I have to stay whole on here in my life for myself. And I, I can't, play this game anymore. Um, I don't know if I successfully like completely stuck to it because it's hard not to get sucked back in uh, to to that. It's a drug. It is truly like an addiction sometimes that you don't realize is really affecting you until suddenly you're like, why am I tired and having panic attacks all the time? This is Mm. confusing. I Mm -hmm. should investigate this. (laughs) Why am I terrified of my own phone? Yeah, exactly. Why do I want to throw this in a river every time (laughs) I pass a body of water? I don't know. (laughs) But I think that's like, I'm with you that like I'm in a process if I don't have it totally figured out, but I know that I need to do like keep conscious of my introspection about all of it and Mm. like stay uh, present in the way that I use social media because it can so easily uh, go, you know, zero to 60, especially if you're talking about things that are so personal. I'm I'm curious uh, how you operate in putting your personal life, you know, you and your partner online and like, you know, your sister and things like that. Like, do you make a conscious effort to keep private life private and then post kind of consciously the people in your life and things in your life that you want to? Um, no, I don't have that figured out at all. (laughs) I I think for me, I have always so valued vulnerability and authenticity Mm. online. And I've been so conscious that I never want to become the highlight reel of everything perfect. But then there's a balance there because you also want to protect the privacy of people around you. You don't necessarily want to be like me and my partner having a shit time right now. This is all my trauma. Spill <laughs> yeah. out my emotion. Like so I tend to 
I tend to share things after I've worked through them and mm. I've learned something from them. I no longer, I no longer generally like share when I'm right in the middle of something that's so raw and so vulnerable, but yeah. I'm okay speaking about it afterwards. Obviously I still keep some things, but yeah. that's, it's a hard balance to figure. Do you feel like you've got that balance? Uh, no. Uh, well, I think, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm constantly aware and, you know, you become friends with every, a lot of people that work in the same kind of platforms that you work in. And I, I've seen other people lose a sense of themselves um, and their privacy because once you put a lot of things out there, you can't take them back. And it's a bigger, I think, um, step to walk back your boundaries rather than just put it all out there. And it does take like, you know, it's so easy. And I worry so much about like younger generations thinking that their value comes in showing authenticity, meaning like them as total messes in the raw state and Mm. relying on the internet to give them some like clarity or some like uplifting, fleeting, you know, serotonin from something Mm -hmm. versus what you're doing, which I think is a great way to do it work through your shit and then be able to talk about it kind of retroactively from a place of like conclusions rather than like we're in it right now that's so interesting though because that's a that's something that I still have to honestly try and ask myself is why are you sharing this exactly are you yeah. sharing this so that people see that you're a human and mm-hmm. you get some kind of feeling of love because you deserve that anyway. Like you shouldn't have to pour your soul out in order to receive that. That's a slippery slope, right? Or are you yeah. sharing it because you feel kind of healed and maybe it will help, but you're not going to hurt anymore. That's that's the difference. Yeah, it's a constant process. Um, okay, one last question before we take a quick break. Uh, what is a quintessential Essex girl? <laughs> have you ever been? Um, I haven't been. Um, I've seen some British television. Um, and so I'm curious, um, if what I see on TV, uh, maps over what it means to you. Um, Grace, what have you been watching? I have watched, uh, a, well, one, I've watched Drag Race where the, uh, queens have obviously shown up as Essex girls. I've watched, oh, what was that other reality show where they all live in a house? Um, <laughs> like all of them that's every reality show and i feel like (laughs) they're all essex girls uh that lived in the house and it might be some old school show uh but i've also seen a little bit of towie okay i mean out of those i mean drag race has probably got it the most right (laughs) i would say um i don't i don't generally fit into the stereotypical essex girl but you know what i reject that stereotype because (laughs) it's largely like a misogynist and derogatory and essex girls are multifaceted and complicated even if we well not me even if a lot of us do use a lot of fake tan and speak in a certain way Look, I'm from New Jersey and I have the same opinion about the Jersey girl stereotype Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) that uh, shows like Jersey Shore have really illuminated for the world. (laughs) Um, Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I have, guess what? A bunch more questions for you. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. Hi, friends. Grace Helbig here from the podcast Not Too Deep, which you are currently listening to, hosted by me, Grace Helbig. Just wanted to say a couple of things. One, thank you so much for listening. And two, if you are enjoying yourself to such a degree that you'd love to leave us a um, review on the Apple Store, that would be so appreciated because again you are very appreciated for giving us your time your ears your attention whatever it may be uh and that was my couple of things now back to me me yeah i think i i struggled to a bit in kind of and we're back in um with the idea that you talk about in the video of like being afraid to be yourself or say something that you know is true to you but it doesn't maybe um represent the the idea of you that you've already like built like you know i guess it's called growing up (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and evolving as like a person and you're not just a brand that's frozen in time for the rest of time yeah isn't it weird how like the internet likes to talk a big game about growth and change but if you actually do it they're like oh not like that no no we don't like that (laughs) veto 
Um, okay, I have to talk about Gemma, your sister. Mm-hmm. Uh, you seem to have the most lovely relationship. How did uh, creating content with Gemma start? Well, I have been part of my sister's care team for longer than I've been doing this. So I think the last nine, almost 10 years, wow. I am one of her primary carers. Mm-hmm. And so the whole time that I was doing Body Posi Panda and creating this content and writing the book and everything, she was a huge part of my life. You know, I was with her so much of the time, yeah. but I kept that separation for a lot of reasons. I mean, she didn't seem that interested in it at the time. And I didn't want to expose her to things. Right. I didn't want people to like misread my intentions. Right. And then I can't, I can't remember how it started, but I think we do, we spend so much time just being ridiculous, singing Disney songs to each other, dancing around. I thought, let me, let me put some of this up. Let me just share yeah. that this is my actual life. Like she's such a big part of my life and people freaking love her. And of yeah. course they do because she's a little ball of sass who doesn't give a fuck (laughs) she has such fierce opinions and she's had no filter and i love it so much yeah and she has so loved coming into that world because you know we're we're two sisters from a little small town in essex where nothing Mm -hmm. happens generally people stay here yeah they don't do much and, you know, now she she gets to go along in her life thinking, hm, I've met Little Mix and, you know, <laughs> I've, I've been to the Brit Awards. And, you know, she's this like she's become her own superstar. Yeah. And I think that's the most like beautiful thing that I could have given her. Like it's it's my favorite thing that I've done in my entire career. Like I've yeah, she she has become someone beyond her wildest dreams and you know yeah. she gets stopped in the street of people being like oh my god I love you and she's like Lem-. actually her ego could use taking down a, t- a couple pegs if anyone's <laughs> listening to this and you do see Gemma out just like take her down a couple because it's getting <laughs> it's getting a bit much at this stage there are there plans for upcoming content for new series etc series easy easies um the, all the content I make with Gemma is just whatever she feels like making at the time because <laughs> I don't want to like put her on a schedule of like, all right, this right. day we film this because um, yeah. it has to, she has to be into it. She has to want to do it. So mm-hmm. right now she's still kind of feeling the high bitch, by bitch where I just <laughs> present her with a topic and she either says hi bitch or bye bitch. We love yeah. that. Um, <laughs> but I might do more car journeys with Gemma. We might try something completely different. Who knows? I have a little idea that I kind of want... Um, she she writes she writes these giant novels in her spare time and they're like wow. love stories involving her and usually <laughs> Hugh Grant. Um, <laughs> oh, I would I would read them. I would yeah. watch the teleplay of them. Whatever. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. So maybe that's the dream. Co-write co-write the epic oh. love story of her and Hugh. Huh. I mean. Okay, speaking of live shows, like if you need to put this up on a stage or something, um, <laughs> are you, I know that you had planned some live shows before COVID happened. Is that true? I had. So I had, um, I did a tour. I mm-hmm. created this live show with my best friend called the Never Say Diet Club. And yeah. it was kind of like if um, a TED Talk and a drag show had a baby it had singing dance we did parody songs we did dances we did like five costume changes and all talking about letting go of diet culture and how to accept yourself it was so much fun and we we toured the UK with that once and we were just getting ready to go again and then COVID shuts down Uh, yeah yeah are there are there plans in the future maybe or it just depends on what the world decides to do I'm not sure you know there's so I feel like everyone at the moment is kind of reevaluating what still fits, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, totally. And so we're not sure if that has had its moment, which is okay as well yeah. to move on to the next thing, but we'll see. Totally. Um, okay. I'm going to now get into the two questions that I ask every single guest that is on the podcast. And the first is, uh, who alive or dead would you most like to throw cold spaghetti at? Yeah. Oh, I wish I had been given this in advance. <laughs> well, this is, we'll take the pressure out of it because 
we look at this as an answer that's just your answer right now. This answer obviously can change hour to hour, day to day, week to week. Mm. So it's just whoever comes to mind and it doesn't have to be a negative situation. It can be positive and celebratory if you choose. A celebratory cold spaghetti. <laughs> Who would really appreciate cold spaghetti? Right. I, <laughs> this is this is this is weirdly dark. I will throw cold spaghetti at my dog who died <laughs> because she would just really appreciate it and I'll give her a snack from the grave. Oh, I think that would be some sort of beautiful uh, spiritual ritual in a way. <laughs> <laughs> has anyone ever said that before? Dead dog? Was, has that been an answer? That is uh, the first time we've gotten dead dog as an answer. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome, world. <laughs> uh, the other question I ask every single guest is to tell us your worst pant shitting story, but or, or like a bathroom emergency situation. <laughs> But you can only use three words or three small phrases to describe the situation. So, for example, mine uh, is college jogging front lawn. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Or I'm sorry, university jogging front lawn. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, so funny i had one of these situations literally mm. last week <gasps> good um, for you so let me share that okay i hope if my partner listen listens to this he will have no idea what i'm talking about because i didn't tell him <laughs> but i was away with him um, okay when this when this happened so three words uh-huh tree house ah uh, good start Ah. <laughs> uh, Horses galloping towards me. <laughs> Sweating. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that sounds, it started out sounding like a beautiful romance novel uh, and quickly <laughs> took a turn. Well, no follow up questions. We'll let everyone's minds kind of fill in the gaps there, including your partner. Uh, now we have a section called Deep and Hot where I ask you a deep, question that we have prepared for you um and for your hot take on uh kind of like a a topic or a question that we we have prepared for you Mm. so so the first deep question um that i think we've kind of touched on a little bit but do you ever doubt the sincerity of positive comments from like that you see online because I feel like there's I know for myself I get into such a headspace sometimes when I'm not like doing well where I get so locked in on like one really negative comment versus you know being able to actually see the positive comments and so I wonder if you ever doubt the sincerity of positive comments I mean you try to foster a like beautiful community body posse uh, and so I, I just a, a quick wonder. I would say that I do tend to trust positive comments that come from my audience because yeah. they're most of them are there because we have something really vulnerable in common. Um, yeah. they're not there because they think I'm this like shiny famous person who they're going to get some kind of like shininess themselves from. Cause that's right. not what I, what I put out. Um, so I, I do trust them. And when I meet them, they're always like beautiful and sincere and they give great hugs. Mm. Um, So I I trust that. I think over the years, I have definitely less and less, less trusted, less and less the kindness that comes from uh, colleagues, (laughs) Uh. people people in the same industry, um, other people who do similar similar work and I used yeah. to be so so trusting and you know how it is you trust yeah. you get burned yep. you you learn um yeah that's been a real a real learning curve you get a little burn that sticks with you that you can look at uh, in the future and be like I remember okay I'll be uh-huh. a little bit more conscious of hot stoves around me now before I put yeah. my hands on yeah. them <laughs> yeah and it's so sad it's so sad that you have to do that because that's not in my nature to be like skeptical or like just 
Yeah, but I think it's also just being cognizant, being aware that humans are complex creatures and it's in your best interest to just, uh, you know, be aware of people's intentions or try to understand people's intentions. You're really good at blocking haters, right? (laughs) I do have the fastest thumb in in the whole West, yeah. I just started doing that this year. I feel like I'm so late to the game. I don't know what I was doing before. And it truly is a cathartic experience. I'll say that. <laughs> My block list is, is thousands long. <laughs> thousands well, long. Amazing. Uh, I'm curious which platform, if there is one that you feel like most at home on or that you enjoy the most. Ooh, that is interesting. You know what? I'm going to throw a curveball mm-hmm. and um, say at the moment, I'm really enjoying the platform that I started doing my newsletter on, which is Substack, mm. which is not where my big, big audience is. It's a small group of people there. But because they signed up to hear directly from me every week, yeah. they're my people. Like they're, they're so supportive. We have conversations. I know what's going on in some of their sex lives. Like (laughs) it feels kind of like the, the regular social media platforms back in the day yeah, and has this like blogging aspect to it. So I'm really loving that at the moment. And you just launched that. It's been, I think it's been three months. Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, what kind of content are you doing over there? So I am writing a newsletter called is it just me or, Mm -hmm. and every week I take a topic that has been running through my mind that you're kind of not supposed to talk about on the internet maybe and get honest and get vulnerable and, and, and put it out there and say, am I the only one feeling like this? And most of the time I am definitely not the only one feeling like it. And so it's just been a nice, almost like visit back to when things were more like a diary and just honest. Yeah. A group share for Mm. everyone. Oh, that's so lovely. Um, okay. Here's your hot take topic ish kind of question. What is your hot take when people think or say that you've changed, uh, as your brand continues to grow? Thank fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. Can you imagine being someone who goes through life exactly the same as they have always been Uh, like, Jesus, thank the Lord that I have changed because I wouldn't want to be who I was five years ago or 10 years ago. You have to adapt. That's the whole point, isn't it? This, this, yeah, we've already, we've already mentioned this, this bizarre thing of you're supposed to stay the same person forever and ever and ever in order to keep other people comfortable. No, absolutely not. Uh, I love that. And I think that's wonderful because I think it gives people just the permission that they need to uh, change. (laughs) Change Mm -hmm. is good. Um, I'm curious, what do you, what do you watch? What do you Um, indulge in? What do I watch? Lately, I have been watching Sex Education. Ah, I haven't watched it yet. (gasps) Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Well, I've watched it. I've watched it twice through. It's like very, I would say it's very British in its humor, but it's so like progressive in its storylines. And it's a very like sex positive show with all these nuanced characters. It's beautiful. Mm. Um, If I'm real, I'm not proud of this. If I'm real low, which I have been a little bit recently, I will yeah. go back to Glee uh, uh, just yeah. for the pure comfort of it. And yeah. it's, <laughs> it's so problematic. It's like it hasn't aged well in so many categories, but oh, it does the job, you know? Yeah. I mean, the songs are still like, <laughs> there. The music is still there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, if the mm-hmm. content might be questionable, but I like that that's your, I guess, guilty pleasure is great. <laughs> You know what? Whatever I'm watching, it has to be colorful, positive. Mm. Like real life is bleak enough sometimes. I need something that is genuinely just gonna be bright and, and lovely and kind. You know? Yeah. Um. You're uh, speaking of color. You you live in this like beautiful color like um uh, cartoon kind of like environment <laughs> that's so like welcoming and lovely. How often are you dyeing your hair? Ooh, every couple of months. Wow. And And you um, do it yourself. I do it myself. I do the color myself. My mom still does my roots, which she has done (laughs) from day one, because you don't want to, with color, you can be a bit experimental. You can just chuck it on here and there. You don't want to mess with bleach and get it in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your mom has to do the back of your head if she's willing to. (laughs) And yeah, from 
I've, I've just always done it myself. It's a, I'm a control freak. I don't want to give that to someone else. That's all it is. I get it. But you also are like you DIY. I feel like everything one, you're great at makeup and two, you like make your clothes and dye your clothes and all kinds of stuff. Is there a DIY that you haven't attempted yet that is in like, <laughs> so I feel like are you doing home makeovers? Like where does the where does it stop? Bless you, Grace. You are giving me <laughs> so too much credit. My home is a crumbling mess. Um, <laughs> it stops at anything that like isn't appearance based. Anything that would actually uh, be useful, I could. I probably couldn't put together a shelving unit. I'm going to be real honest with you. But if you give me the shelving unit in pieces and yeah. tell me to paint it nice colors, that I can do. Done and done. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Okay, we're going to take one last break. Uh, when we get back, we're going to answer a question that's submitted by one of you guys. So. We'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. Okay, we're back in. And Megan, we have people that have submitted some questions that I think uh, you might have some great perspective on. Okay. So this one is about um, moving. Uh, they say I'm leaving for college in a couple days. I've lived in the same house and therefore town my entire life. I've gone to school with the same people since I was three. Now I'm moving 900 miles away and I'm nervous and excited question mark. I have pretty bad anxiety and won't be able to just come home when I want. How do I find just a bit of comfort so far away from my home? Uh, I really love this podcast. Oh, thank you. Um, so finding comfort when you're away from home. Do you want to go first? Do you give your opinion as well? I give my opinion as well. Yeah, I think this is you are, first of all, so valid to feel nervous and excited. And sometimes those feelings are interchangeable. Um, but this is like a big threshold crossing, which I think is so exciting and important for everyone, even if you're moving, you know, five miles away from where you grew up. It's just like having that sense of independence. How do you find comfort so far away from your home? Hmm. It depends what you define as comfort for yourself. I mean, I would say bring something from home or have some sort of like um, open line of communication with your family at home. So you know that you can communicate with them at least virtually or over the phone if you can't visit them in person. Um, and like bring a couple creature comforts from home, whether it's like food that your parents make or a candle that smells like your house or something that's just a little bit familiar without feeling like you brought the whole house to your new place. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a great advice. I mean, you covered it, but I think I would just say probably when you get there, most people are going to be pretending that they don't feel the same way as you, but they probably do. Totally. They probably do. I remember there was such an expectation of going to university that you're just supposed to think it's the best thing ever all the time. And it's so cool. And these new experiences and no one's actually talking about like the mental health impact of it. And it's hard. It's a yeah. really brave thing that, that this person that you're doing. And I hope, I hope when you get there, you can find like a safe group of people or like mm -hmm. an advisor or just someone who you can honestly speak to about how you're actually feeling. Cause guarantee you won't be the only one. Yeah. You, um, on that note about like, you know, you talk about, I think platonic soulmates. Was this something you wrote about life lessons on friendship? Mm, I did. Yeah. It was an essay for, for a book by stylist. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the idea of platonic soulmates? I think we spend our whole lives believing that the ultimate connections we're going to make are romantic. And I've mm -hmm. definitely believed that myself. And romantic connections can be beautiful and wonderful and teach you things and, and great. Um, but I, I kind of believe in almost being romantic in your friendships and mm. giving, giving your friends the same kind of love that you would want from a partner, maybe without like the, the physical aspect depends, <laughs> depends what you're into in your friendships, yep. but just really cherishing those connections as just as special and just as important because you can get so much from them. You can get so much from them that you don't have to kind of like wait around for a romantic someone. And I mean, I think that's really beautiful. And how, in terms of that, do you have any thoughts or advice on like, 
making friendships as an adult, like this, this person that's leaving for college, essentially, if you don't know anyone there already, you, you want to try to find or cultivate some sort of core group or core person. It doesn't have to be a bunch of people. Just find, like you said, someone that you really kind of um, can can experience this together in like a safe way. I'm mm-hmm. curious your thoughts on like how to make adult friendships. That's a question that we get asked a lot. That's That's interesting. I would say that it's important to not, latch onto the first person you meet because they're the first person you meet but actually they're not going to be your person you don't have tons in common you know when you go into those spaces where for the first time everyone's coming from completely different circumstances not everyone's going to be your person and that's all right you'll know you'll know when someone is you'll know when someone kind of has that energy that you feel safe you feel like you can share things and you're excited to be around them and you get energy from being around them Mm -hmm. and I think it's really important to be proactive and I'm saying this to myself as well post-pandemic getting back into actually seeing other humans do reach out do say hey I would actually love to spend time with you and give them a date like yeah I feel like we spend quite a lot of time waiting for other people to invite us to things or make friendships happen. And we are an equal player in that, you know? Totally. That's my biggest thing is that I'm such a, like, I hope someone asks me to hang out versus Mm. just asking someone to hang out. It's that fear of like rejection that you don't want to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. But especially for this person that's going to college, like you said, with all of these other people that are going to be, whether they show it or say it or not, equally as vulnerable and excited and nervous about it, that the more you put yourself out there, the more you'll get back closer to what you want. Yeah, I'm excited for them. It's going to be great. It it might not all be amazing, but a lot of it will be. There you go. Um, Megan, we're getting to the end of this podcast, which is wild because I feel like I could talk to you for hours. Where can people like, what are you working on next? What's, what's coming down the pipe for you? So the newsletter has been the latest thing that I have launched that is on Substack. You can search Megan Jane Crab, or mm-hmm. is it just me or, uh, on socials? I'm Megan Jane Crab on Instagram, Twitter, Megan J Crab, rude that my name was too long. <laughs> <laughs> and there you will see all the things that I'm doing and all the things that I'm creating. Amazing. And before you go, just for making time for us, we like to give a little um, personalized gift. We've uh, personalized a horoscope for you. Uh-huh. You're not astrologers. Melissa has put it in the chat if you'd like to read um, your horoscope aloud for everyone. Oh, wow. Dear Aquarius. First of all, that's debatable. Um, I think I'm a cusp, but all right. Oh, cuspy. Dear, <laughs> dear Capricorn Aquarius cusp, water bearer of the stars. You may have been holding high self-esteem this week um, until a hater knocked you on your back. <laughs> this will shake you up and have your moods swinging, but pay no mind. Do as any good Brit does. Keep calm and carry on blocking that arsehole. <laughs> Who wrote this? Okay. Grace, be honest. <laughs> I can't take full credit for it, but I can say someone within our uh, (laughs) assembly here at Not Too Deep has cultivated this for you. Wow. It's almost as if they know me quite well um, (laughs) and I need to read this every single day. So thank you. You got it. Thank you, Megan. This has been (laughs) so lovely. Guys, go check out everything that she is up to. Also, Body Positive Power, Because Life is Already Happening and You Don't Need Flat Abs to Live It is a book, right? That came out oh, years yeah. ago. Yeah, it's still relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thing, four years you're, ago. You're better than I am uh, promoting my st- own stuff. Wow. <laughs> oh, thank you again. This has been lovely. And we'll see you guys next time on another episode of Not Too Deep. Goodbye. Too deep. Too deep. Too deep. Too deep. Not too deep with Grace Helbig. Not too deep is a production of Grace Helbig Incorporated. Producer Melissa D. Montz, edited by Shireen Lani Yunus. Post production sound by Chris Henry, and an extra special thanks to Flula for the theme music. Not too deep.